Well, aloha. It's Wednesday again, and you know what day that is. Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Yuen. I'm joined today uh, by two guests, uh, Peter Rosig from uh, Hawaiian Electric Company, and he's got some good news for everyone, so hold that thought. And uh, Noel Morin from the Big Island Electric Vehicle Association, a gathering place for Hawaii EV or electric vehicle enthusiasts. So first of all, uh, Peter, I'm gonna go to you. And uh, you have some good news for everybody out there. So well, how about I, it, it is good news in a way. And that is that uh, at the Public Utilities Commission request, we have, uh, we're not gonna be doing any disconnections through the end of the year, through uh, at least through December 31st. Uh, as you know, we started in March and then we've extended it once now, uh, given the circumstances we've extended it again. So, uh, you know, the last thing we wanna do is cut somebody's electricity. So we will not. Uh, you know, be turning anybody off for lack of payment, to, uh, at least through the end of the year. But the other side of that coin is that you're still going to, if you're not paying your bill or part of your bill every month, you're still going to owe that money. Eventually, you're going to have to pay. And so this would be a great time to, uh, if you haven't been paying or if you're having a problem or you think you're going to have a problem, would, this is a great time to go to hawaiianelectric.com slash payment arrangement. And uh, then you can uh, get work out a payment arrangement. And there's going a lot. There are a lot of different arrangements there. You could do it over different periods. Uh, if you aren't paying your anything at all right now, we strongly urge you to pay something, uh, because at the end of the day, you're going to have to pay for this approximately nine or ten months uh, that you didn't pay, and it's going to be a big bill at the end, and nobody wants to face that. So the good news is no disconnections. We're very glad not to have anybody have to worry about being without power uh, due to not having paid a bill through the end of the year. But we really, really urge people to go to hawaiianelectric.com slash payment arrangement if you are not paying your bill, if you haven't paid, if you've gotten behind. We can't help you if you have not let us know. And there are also links to some places that can help you with this problem if you need uh, financial assistance through one of the programs uh, like the CARES Act and so forth. But the first step is up to you. If you have not been paying your bill regularly, if you're getting behind, if you fear you're going to get behind, go to hawaiianelectric.com slash payment arrangement and uh, let us know. It's a very simple form and then we can begin to talk to you about how to work things out. Uh, we, the last, last thing we want to do to anybody is turn off their power because they didn't pay. And the second to the last thing is we don't want to see anybody in nine or 10 months stuck with a huge bill that really, really makes it hard for them. So that's the story. So I guess you can also go to the Hawaiian Electric website and look at energy efficiency uh, strategies that people can use to try and keep that bill from getting too big. Yes, absolutely. But do something. Right. Okay. Well, thank, thank you very much, Peter. And now I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Noel Moran from the Big Island Electric Vehicle Association. So welcome, Noel. Aloha, Mitch. Thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, so I'd like to know a lot more, and I'm sure our audience would like to know a lot more about the Big Island EV Association. Like, uh, I didn't know too much about it at all until I reached out to you or you reached out to me a few uh, months ago. And it looks like a pretty neat organization. So why don't you tell us all about it? Why, why, it, why do we have one? And uh, how, you know, how are you supporting electric vehicles on the Big Island? Great. Um, so I'll start off by saying that we, our organization started in 2011 um, as Hawaii or EV Hawaii. Uh, essentially a whole bunch of uh, Leaf, Nissan Leaf owners got together. Uh, this was early on at the start of uh, uh, the ramp up of uh, EVs. Uh, and uh, we decided to get together so we can figure out how to help each other. After a while, we, we determined that there was an opportunity for us to help uh, others adopt electric vehicles, uh, uh, vehicles and uh, in doing so, uh, allow for uh, more EV charging infrastructure, um, more support, um, increased um, dealership uh, support, and so on and so forth. The, the idea was that the more of us on the road, the more popular it would become and it would become the norm. So we essentially shifted our, our focus uh, to 
in, enhance the adoption of electric vehicles across, across the island. So this was back in 2011. Uh, back then we had about uh, 40 or so uh, electric vehicles on Hawaii Island. Uh, as of July this year, we have about 800 uh, electric vehicles in, on this island. Our association is about uh, close to 300 members. And uh, we, in, we, we essentially invite EV owners as well as uh, would-be EV owners and uh, supporters of sustainable uh, transportation to be part of our, uh, our organization and to help with our mission. Um, we, uh, the, the, the programs that we're, we're involved with are primarily on advocacy and education. So we have, um, uh, prior to COVID, we were doing monthly uh, meetups where we would advertise ahead of time the fact that we, the, a group of us would be at a coffee shop, for example, and we would invite the general public to come and talk story, learn about EVs from actual EV owners, maybe get behind the wheel or get in the seat of one and learn, uh, learn about the car. It was a terrific way to get people really um, behind, eventually behind the wheel. Um, we also have a website where we share a lot of information. We're on social media. Uh, we also host events. Uh, there are a couple of big events throughout the year, a National Drive Electric Week, as well as um, uh, Drive Electric uh, Earth Day. Uh, this year, because of COVID, uh, a number of these activities have shifted into the online format. So uh, later in September and early October, we will be hosting a couple of webinars where we can socialize the benefits and, of electric vehicles and also address questions that people might have. Um, as far as other activities, we... Uh, we, uh, we have individuals in our club who act as consultants. So if there are people that are interested in a specific vehicle, for example, we're able to match them up with someone who owns the vehicle and they can exchange information, uh, get questions addressed, maybe even meet in person to take a look at the car. So these, these activities allow us to get the word out essentially to uh, demystify the EV and um, hopefully get more, more uh, EV drivers on the road. We are also very uh, active in supporting the expansion of EV infrastructure. And by that, I mean um, helping um, potential site hosts to understand what's entailed in getting a, uh, an EV charger on their, uh, on their site, working with local government, working with the utility to identify potential uh, locations for these, uh, for these uh, charging stations, and then also helping the general public understand you know, how they're used and uh, also EV owners to understand where they're located and how, how to utilize and access them. Um, lastly, we're um, involved in policy advocacy. So there are certain policies that are conducive to the expansion of uh, EV infrastructure, to the adoption of, of EVs. There, uh, a good example would be uh, uh, tax incentives for the purchase of a, of a new EV. Things like this have historically been very important because EVs tend to be ex uh, more expensive than gas counterparts, but uh, that's slowly uh, but surely changing. We, we now have a number of EVs that are out there that are uh, almost comparable to um, similarly sized uh, gas cars. So, so what kind of tax incentives do we have in place now? I mean, we used to have a really generous tax incentive. Is that still the case? Um, what kind of level are we talking about? Yeah, there, 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 uh, several years ago, uh, in fact, back in 2011, when we purchased our first EV, the, the state had a, uh, a rebate, an actual rebate. It was a $5,000 uh, rebate for the purchase of an EV. And wow. there, was, there was even a, uh, an incentive for a rebate for the installation of a, a charging station, a home charging station. Right. Uh, th that doesn't exist at the moment. Uh, it, it, uh, and uh, there's an opportunity there. The other, the other incentive comes in the form of a, a federal tax credit. And uh, that, is, uh, that still exists. Uh, it's been pared down and, uh, and for some makes and models, uh, they're no longer in existence. So for example, Tesla uh, no longer qualify, a Tesla purchase no longer qualifies for the $7,500 um, uh, tax credit. But there are other EVs where that is still applicable. So um, there, uh, Depending on the depending on the electric vehicle, uh, and also depending on the tax situation for the uh, the purchaser, there there could be some tax uh, federal tax uh, incentives or benefits. All right. So, what is the uh, main uh, speed bump or barrier for where people pause before they buy the electric vehicle? What 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 you know? Is there one or there's several? What what are the uh, 
kind of speed bumps that have to be overcome to, to get people incentivized to actually buy one. I think the main one now is uh, consumer awareness, misconception right. about the vehicles. Uh, several years ago, the, the, consider the considerations were cost. Uh, another consideration was range. There were, people were concerned that they wouldn't be able to um, get by for the entire uh, commute day without you know, having to, to, to figure out a charging uh, solution. Um, and, uh, and just misconceptions about the technology. Uh, you know, the safety of batteries and, you know, things along those lines. Um, some of those issues persist today. There, there are still some misconceptions about cost. Uh, the fact of the matter is there are, like I mentioned earlier, there are a number of EVs that are very uh, affordable now. The other consideration is that there are pre-owned electric vehicles that are very affordable and, um, and uh, still have a, quite a bit of life in them. So, so that would be one general... Uh, misconception uh, or a barrier, uh, and that would be just a misunderstanding about the the qualities, the um, operation of the cost to own uh, an electric vehicle. And uh, fortunately, that's an that's an easy is issue to solve, right? Because it's it's educating, it's you know getting them to uh, getting them in, in in situations where they can converse and getting information in front of them. Uh, the other issue is uh, the charging infrastructure. And uh, why, whereas many EV owners will have ready, uh, readily available in their home, even just a 110 or a 220 outlet as a charging uh, station, there are quite a few, especially in, in Oahu, where uh, there's a high um, percentage of condos and apartment uh, dwellers where it may not be possible to have access to a uh, you know, home charging uh, unit. So the charging infrastructure um, continues to be a, a barrier to some extent, particularly in uh, really dense, uh, um, densely populated places where there's a high, high number of uh, condo dwellers. Um, the uh, here on, on Hawaii Island, it's less of an issue now. And the reason for that is the uh, number of EVs that have a um, significant amount of range. And I, I personally define that as 200 miles or more of range per, you know, per charge, uh, that that is usually more than enough to, to satisfy the, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, fueling requirement for an EV owner here. Again, if, they're, if they live in a condo or an apartment, there's still that issue and therefore they would need to have access to good charging infrastructure. So those two, uh, in my opinion, consumer awareness would be one, uh, poor consumer awareness, and then the other would be uh, inadequate charging infrastructure. So what are we doing about condominiums? Like, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, pushback, I understand, and uh, condominium associations not willing to, you know, spend the money to put in charging infrastructure. It can be a major deal to upgrade their uh, power input. Is that is that an issue? Does it have to be legislated? Um, what do you see there? What's that situation? Do you I that a little bit more. Yeah, I, you know, this this is an area that I uh, I need to learn about more uh, uh, a, a bit more about. But uh, what what I'm aware of is that um, there is the opportunity with legislation to ensure that uh, future construction would offer uh, property owners or uh, you know property managers with access to the infrastructure required for charging stations. So uh, Honolulu. Um, uh, Passed, I, I can't recall the name of the bill right now, but uh, there is a there, there was a, a, a bill that was passed that essentially um, mandated EV ready uh, charging infrastructure um, for new construction. So if it's a condo or a commercial dwelling or co commercial um, uh, complex, that there would be infrastructure conduits just to ensure that at some point in the future, the installation of a Charging uh, charging station wouldn't be a very costly uh, endeavor, so that would be one one thing. But in in addition to that, I think that um, having publicly accessible charging stations, and uh, our utility has been very good about um, identifying uh, opportunities for DC fast chargers, which allow for rapid charging of an EV. So very uh, similar to um, not not exactly the same, but similar to going to a gasoline station where you're able to top off uh, with a DC fast charger, you're able to um, you know, uh, recharge your battery to a significant percentage uh, in 15, 20, 30 minutes. 
Um, so having those strategically placed around the islands uh, will allow for um, will, will allow for uh, condo dwellers who don't have access to charging stations to be able to charge. So I actually have a question from a viewer. And yes. here's the question. Well, what about horsepower? I live on the big island and need a truck for my farm. Are there EV trucks available? How much do they cost? And do they have their horsepower to do the job on a farm? Yes, yes. Um, uh, so the answer is uh, they're not yet, they're not yet uh, available, but they're coming soon. And, um, and there are quite a few of these uh, EV um, uh, or, or electric trucks that are coming from a number of uh, manufacturers. Uh, Tesla's coming up with a cyber truck. Rivian has a, uh, a, a, an electric truck. Uh, there's the Nikola uh, Badger, which comes in fuel cell and battery electric. Ford F-150 is coming out with one. Chevy's coming out with one. There are a number of these uh, manufacturers, new as well as established, that, that recognize that this is a form factor that's really important for right. contractors. And uh, obviously here on the island, it's a very popular, uh, popular vehicle. Sure, yeah. Uh, so those are coming. And as far as um, power is concerned, uh, electric vehicles have quite a bit of torque and they, they have access to all that torque instantly. Uh, so, uh, you know, one can go online and look up uh, Ford F-150 um, uh, videos and electric uh, uh, F-150 videos, and you can see that you can see it pulling a train. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so uh, it, it's not an issue. Uh, right. Torque is not an issue with, with the electric vehicle uh, uh, drivetrain. So what kind of a EV do you have personally? So I have a, uh, I have a uh, Tesla, a 2013 uh, Tesla Model S. Okay. That's something that uh, we, we uh, purchased uh, to, to replace our uh, Nissan Leaf uh, back in uh, 2014. And I uh, love the car. It, uh, it works, works very well. It doesn't have all the high-tech gadgetry as the newer Teslas, but it, right. it does the job for, for us. So that's what, about a seven-year-old car now? Did you say 2013? Yeah, we purchased it and it was uh, manufactured in 2013, late 2013. So what's the battery life on it? Uh, how, how are you doing with the batteries? The battery still staying re relatively yes. healthy or? Yes, yes. Um, I think it gets 265 or so for a full charge. Wow. Now um, with uh, EV owners uh, know to avoid charging to 100% to, to maximize the life of the, of the battery for daily, daily use, I try to maintain, uh, I charge up to 80%. So I never, you know, never get a chance to try and figure out how many miles from 100 yeah. down to zero. <laughs> right. Well, I used to have a gasoline car that only you got 200 miles on a tank of gas. And that was plenty for me. I mean, that's just me. But Big Island, of course, you have a lot, lot bigger ranges. I have another question. I, I tried to buy a, um, a, um, a hybrid when I first came to Hawaii 18 years ago, and I couldn't get a bank loan because there was no history uh, it was a Prius, and it had no history about uh, these kinds of cars. What's uh, how easy is it now to get financing for an electric vehicle? Is, have they solved that problem? Yes, I, I, I haven't heard of any uh, challenges getting financing and also yeah. insurance for for electric vehicles. Um, in fact, uh, as far as insurance went, it was comparable to what we were paying for our gas car when we when we purchased the the Nissan Leaf. Uh, so it, it, I, I have not heard of it being an issue in terms of obtaining financing. Okay, so what about, okay, so let's look at some of the barriers. Um, what kind of legislation, is there any legislation that we need in place? I mean, they've clawed back some of the benefits uh, that electric vehicles had like free parking at the airport and uh, you know, I forget what the other ones are. I think the free parking was a, was a big clawback. Um, the perception was, though, that some EV owners were uh, like playing the system and going and parking their car in the airport for free for like weeks at a time. Um, so that's one thing that happened. But what kind of legislation, what kind of policy do you think is needed to overcome some of the barriers and, or encourage, you know, uh, EVs more like, should we get the incentives back or what, what do you think? Or what's your, what's the organization think we need to get done? I think that, uh, I think the incentives continue to be important. Uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about is uh, 
you know, the, just the social equity angle um, in, in the past, uh, when these EVs were first coming out, including the Nissan Leaf, they were out of reach for the general, the general public. Uh, right. when, you, when you migrate over to the Tesla, even more so, right? You're talking about right. vehicles that were like over $100,000. So what, what's important, I think, is, 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 is that there is the ability for uh, you know, the general public, uh, including uh, lower income um, uh, groups to be able to afford uh, the electric vehicle. Um, one thing that could assist with this is to ensure that the incentives that are installed uh, take into account um, the social equity piece. So rather than have a, uh, you know, a, um, a policy that says anybody, if you purchase an, an electric vehicle, you get a $2,500 rebate, uh, it, it ought to take into account the, um, the income, uh, you know, the income uh, uh, strata or, you know, of the, uh, of the um, purchasers. So, right. so that would be one thing. I think that that continues to be an important uh, piece to it. Uh, the legislation should also take into account the nature of the vehicles. So for example, um, having a rebate or some type of incentive apply not only to new vehicles, but maybe vehicles be below a certain price point. So now you're targeting right. a lower, you know, a lower cost, a more affordable EV. And maybe even uh, pre-owned vehicles. You I was going to ask you about the secondary market, like exactly, exactly, and that's that's now substantial. There are there are quite a few pre-owned uh, electric vehicles that represent a very uh, very um, uh, you know affordable uh, uh, solution for for many. Layer, layering on top of that a uh, an incentive that uh, that allows a buyer of a pre-owned vehicle uh, to be able to leverage that incentive as well, I think would 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 do wonders. There uh, on the infrastructure side, there there are quite a few things that I think uh, can be done. Uh, we do have a law on the books uh, that essentially uh, calls for the installation of an EV charging station as well as a reserved EV parking slot on parking lots that are over a certain uh, size, right? I believe it's a hundred uh, parking stalls or so. Uh, the challenge with, with that law is that it is not being enforced. So there, there, there's an opportunity there to take a look at the, the um, programs that, are, that were intended to, to enhance adoption of uh, electric vehicles, EV charging infrastructure, for example, uh, and ensure that they can actually be, uh, they are actually being executed. And it's not just about getting a charging station installed but also ensuring that they are maintained, that they are reliable, they're you know they're 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 able to be utilized. So those are just a couple of of um, of things. But I the one thing that I'd like to emphasize is that uh, the social equity piece must be and must be emphasized, and that um, and when you look at it from that perspective, you also start to to understand that sustainable transportation is not just about being able to afford and, and drive an electric car. Uh, there are other forms of transit that we need to take into account. So let's let's electrify our mass transit uh, because we have, you know, a good part of our population that is actually on there. And if we're still burning diesel to get people from one point to the other, there's a big opportunity there to um, uh, allow that segment of the population to be able to benefit from electrification. So I'd like to circle back a little bit on the secondary market. So if I'm in a lower... Uh, economic group and I, I want to buy an electric, secondhand electric vehicle, I think my big concern would be how, how much life has this battery gone in it? And am I going to buy this car and then all of a sudden it is stuck with having to replace the battery? So what about some kind of legislation or incentive that allows like uh, people in a certain uh, economic group to get a grant or some kind of a subsidy to actually replace the battery in a second in a, in a used electric vehicle? Uh, maybe that's a little bit further out of the box, but what's uh, what do you think about something like that? I think it's I think it's a uh, I think it's a great idea. Um, there are there are uh, challenges with some of the older Leafs, for example. The, these had batteries that are not as sophisticated as the the newer ones or other EVs. And in situations like that, if you get a bad um, you know a bad battery, you're talking about I don't know five thousand dollars to get that replaced. So finding yeah. a way to um, to offset that. Uh, might also be an opportunity. Um, I think I think one one important thing about the the secondary market is um, also consumer uh, awareness about what they're getting into. So right. there's there's one angle which is 
uh, if if it's a dealership that's selling this this pre-owned vehicle, that they you know they stand behind the product. But a lot of these are being sold on on the private market, and right. I think it's important for uh, would-be EV owners uh, who are purchasing pre-owned to be aware of like the consideration that you you just raised, right? What what that means. Um, and uh, some of these cars still have warranties. Um, and, you know, that might cost a little more, but maybe that's peace of mind, right? So sure. there's education there that I think uh, is very important for uh, our, you know, for Hawaii residents to be aware of. Well, believe it or not, we're, we're, we have about a minute left. No, wow. Yeah, wow, <laughs> it really goes fast. Um, and I want to make sure that I've covered uh, things that you want to get out. So in, in the last minute, or so, is there any, any message or any final thought that you want to leave our audience with? Yes, um, I'm, I'm very passionate about the electrification of transportation because of uh, our, our climate crisis. Uh, the um, uh, transportation accounts for roughly 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Right. And driving an electric car allows an individual to be part of the solution. They were able to instantly shift, you know, turn off their consumption of gasoline and uh, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. So I think it's a very important, um, you know, consideration. And uh, lastly, uh, there are a lot. There's a lot of information on our website, BigIslandEV.org. We also created recently a new organization for the state, HawaiiEV.org. And when you go there, you can actually find information about events that are coming up. We have two webinars on the 29th as well as okay. on October 3rd where we can actually uh, educate, where you, the, the public can actually learn a lot about electric vehicles on Hawaii Island and ask questions. So uh, thanks very much for this opportunity, uh, Mitch. It's, it's been great. Uh, and yes, the time, time flew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I invite you to send us a, out a blast out to your membership so that they can get it and invite them also to pass it on. So it's like a chain reaction so we can get some good coverage and, and they have another ha, uh, I mean, uh, Noel, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and uh, tell us about the Big Island Electric Vehicle Association. So, aloha, everyone. Aloha.